All right. Um, last class, we finished off looking at two different examples regarding confidence interval construction. So we had looked at a example where we built a confidence interval using the standard normal distribution. So that would have been exercise number one. And we also looked at a few questions related to the interpretation of the interval. For example, we talked about the length of the interval, and we also talked about effectively what we can say based off of the structure of the interval. So what the bounds of the interval are telling us in terms of where we believe or in terms of what we are confident the, the population mean might be equal to. Okay, and then in the second exercise, it was a similar problem, except we weren't directly computing a confidence interval in this exercise. Instead, we were computing the margin of error for a confidence interval. But the margin of error actually gives you quite a bit of information. Uh, for example, we used it to compare the precision of two different confidence levels. And what we were able to show is that as our confidence level increases, the width of the interval increases as well, making it less precise. So there's a trade-off between being more confident and having an interval that's tighter to the estimate. Okay, so to summarize these ideas, on slide 13, I have some conclusions related to the two exercises that we had worked through last class. So the length of the interval is the difference between the upper and the lower bound. And we use the length to effective to determine the precision of the interval. But this only really works if you have another interval to compare to. So you might have a 95% interval and you compute the length, which is fine. But in order to get a sense of whether or not that length is going to be, or in order to use that length, you need another percentage confidence interval that you can compare it to. Every confidence interval is centered at the sample mean. So the average of the bounds will be X bar. The margin of error is a function of the standard deviation, the sampling distribution, and the confidence level. So it's a function of the Z or the T value, sigma or S, and, this, and sample size. One of the key takeaways from studying the formula for the margin of error directly is that if we increase the sample size, and hold confidence level and sigma fixed, we will decrease the margin of error. And this is a fairly um, intuitive result. What this is essentially telling us is that the more information we collect from a population, the more precise our interval is going to be. We can also show that if we hold sample size and sigma fixed, uh, so basically for the same sample size, Whenever we increase the confidence level, the margin of error increases as well. And that's what those previous exercises were showing us. All right. We're going to look at a couple examples now of building confidence intervals when we do not have the standard deviation assumption. So, uh, or rather, when we do not know the population standard deviation. This is a more realistic assumption. So, this will be more in line with what you would expect to see when you um, are using confidence intervals and hypothesis tests in practice. So very simply, when we do not know sigma or sigma squared, we simply estimate it using the sample value. So sigma, which is the population standard deviation, can be estimated using little s, which is the sample standard deviation. Right? So this symbol here is the population standard deviation. And this symbol here is the sample standard deviation. I have a little question at the bottom here regarding properties of the of S squared, not something we really need to focus on, but basically just saying because sigma squared is unbiased or because S squared is unbiased for sigma squared, we can also show that the expected value of S squared is 
is equal to sigma squared. But again, not overly relevant to what we're trying to do. Just a little bit of an aside in case you uh, recall the expected value definition. Okay, so effectively all we're doing is replacing sigma with little s. So we don't have the population standard deviation, but we still have our sample. We're gonna compute uh, the sample standard deviation and we're going to use that in our confidence interval formula. You might recall from last class that when you have x bar minus mu divided by sigma over the square root of n, this is a standard normal random variable. When we replace sigma with little s, this random variable shown in equation two, this is now what we would call a student t random variable. Okay, so the effect of changing or replacing sigma with little s is that the distribution of the standardized mean changes to a student's t distribution. So when we divide, when we have x bar minus mu divided by s over the square root of n, we are now studentizing rather than standardizing. Now, basically, what the student t distribution does is give us more variation to work with. So in some sense, you can think of using the student t distribution in order to accommodate for the fact that you are missing population information. On this page, we have a student t density curve, okay? And we have a standard normal density curve. So the red curve here is the standard normal density curve. And the black curve here is going to be our student's t density curve. All right. Um, now, associated with the student t density curve is a degrees of freedom. So we might have, so with this particular curve, let's say, you know, the degrees of freedom is something like 10. I mean, I'm not exactly sure what it is, but for illustrative purposes, we might say that the degree of freedom here is equal to 10. Okay, so degrees of freedom. Is 10. All right, so the way that the student T curve works is the degree of freedom controls the shape of the curve. And the larger the degree of freedom, the more closely the student T curve represents the standard normal curve. So for example, if we were to draw an arrow here pointing up, we could then say that as the degree of freedom, which I'll call DF, increases, the peak of the student t curve moves up, OK? So we have this effect that if we start with, for example, the black curve that we have on slide 16, and we increase degrees of freedom, the peak of the curve is going to pull upwards towards the red curve, which is the standard normal curve. Now, at the same time that that peak moves up, the tail values move in. Okay, so then we can say, as degree of freedom increases, the tails of the students student T curve, um, we'll say drop. Okay. So effectively, for a very large sample size, the student T curve and the standard normal curve are indistinguishable from one another. So the student T curve actually builds, forms a very nice approximation to the standard normal curve when our sample size is very large. 
However, when the sample size is small, um, the student T curve has wider tails than the standard normal curve. So therefore, when we build confidence intervals, we will expect the interval to be wider than the corresponding standard normal interval. Any questions? Okay. All right, so in terms of actually using the confidence interval formula and going through the process of constructing a confidence interval using a student t value, it's really not all that different from what we had seen with the standard normal value. The only difference is like is sigma is replaced with little s. And instead of looking up a z score, we're going to look up a t value. But looking up t values is very straightforward. It's just the process of matching the significance level to the degrees of freedom. And I'll show you some examples of that. Uh, momentarily. All right. So in our first illustration of building a confidence interval when sigma is unknown, we have from a simple random sample, estimates of the theoretical spring constant for six type one springs gave x bar equals 2.03 with little s is equal to 0 0.06. Construct a 95% CI from mu. All right, so as a reminder, our assumptions here are effectively identical to what we had before. So the first assumption is that we have an SRS, and the second assumption is going to be that the population is normal. So the second assumption is slightly different from the, um, in the case that sigma is unknown. In the case that sigma is unknown, we actually require normality of the population rather than just normality of X bar. All right, so this is clearly, the SRS is clearly fine because we have a simple random sample in, or it's told to us in the description that we're using an SRS. In order to determine if the population is normal, I have plotted here a normal QQ plot or a normal probability plot. As a reminder, Normal probability plots take um, transformations of the sample values and plot them against um, values from the standard normal distribution. In short, what we are looking for when we use a normal probability plot is a linear relationship between the values on the y-axis and the values on the x-axis. So basically what we're looking for is evidence that our observations are linear with um, values taken from the standard normal distribution. So if we look at this plot, we can see our six observations here. These appear to be linear, um, or this, these appear to follow a straight line pattern. So I've superimposed this thick straight line on the, or this full straight line on the uh, scatter plot. And you can see that the, the points are following that pattern and they're fairly evenly de deviated from um, that line. What we don't want to see here is any evidence of, of a curvature, which I don't think we see. I think that this again looks quite linear. So in this case, we can say that there's evidence that um, the population from which we sampled is normal. So that would check off the second assumption. So we can say here, yes, since um, I'll write QQ plot shows linearity. Okay. okay, once we have our assumption, our assumptions checked off, we're just following the same three steps that we learned about last class. So we're gonna first find our T value in this case. So in order to do that, we're gonna pull up the uh, student T table. So the student T table has two pages associated with it. Right. So here's page one. So you can see that the way the student T table works 
is we have significance levels in the y-axis, right? So here, 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 or sorry, across the top row and here, not in the y-axis. And then we have degree of freedom going down either side. So basically all we have to do is match the significance level to the degrees of freedom for the question of interest. And then that will give us our T value. Now, as you move down the T table, you can see that the values for each significance level are decreasing as the degrees of freedom are going up. And again, this represents the fact that the tails are coming in to match the standard normal. So for low degrees of freedom, we're further out than we would be if, if the distribution was standard normal. As the degrees of freedom increase, the tails come in to match the standard normal. And this is showing how the T curve changes to essentially approximate the standard normal curve. This trend continues onto page two. So you can see here, we continue to move down the table. The values continue to get smaller and smaller. And then at the end of the student T table, you actually have a set of five Z scores that correspond to the values that we learned how to look up last class. So I had mentioned on Tuesday that there's a quicker way to find Z scores when you're building confidence intervals or constructing hypothesis tests using the um, standard normal distribution. This little um, abbreviate or this little table at the end of the student's T table would be the way of doing that. So this table is giving us Z scores at the 90%, uh, 95%. Well, this is giving us Z scores for essentially an 80%, a 90%, a 95%, a 98% and a 99% confidence interval. So if we have Z subscript any of these five values, we can just pull the Z score from this table directly, which is a little bit easier than looking it up in the standard normal table. You'll also notice that at 2000 degrees of freedom, the um, T values are essentially equal to the Z scores, because again, the T curve basically grows to approximate the Z scores as DF increases. One final note, if you are ever in between degrees of freedom, always round down. Okay, so if between two degrees of freedom, round. Okay, so with degrees of freedom, we always round down. All right, so going back to the question of interest, we have a T value on alpha over two and N minus one. So we have a T value on 0 0.025 because we're building a 95% interval. So as a reminder here, we have alpha is one minus 0 0.95 which is 0 0.05. So we have T 0 0.05 over two, which is 0 0.025 and five degrees of freedom. Okay, so we go to our T table. Just clear this off here. We have T 0 0.025, we have five, and this is where 2.571 comes from. So that's T, our T value is going to be 2.571. And now all we have to do is plug into our formula. So we have X bar 2.03 plus or minus 2.571 multiplied by little s, which is 0 0.068 divided by the square root of six. And this is 1.951 to 2.101. So we can say we are 95% confident that the true mean TSC is between 1.959 and 2.101. So very similar to what we had with the standard normal examples. The only difference here, again, is that we're using a T value and the process of finding the T value is different because we're using a different table. 
Any questions? Okay, so use the information from the preceding question to construct a 90% confidence interval for mu. Will the 90% confidence interval, interval be wider or narrow, narrower than the 90% interval? Okay, so let's start with the second part of this question and then we'll answer the first part. Um, given n equals six and little s is equal to 0 0.068. A 90% CI will be narrower than a 95% CI since the T value at uh, the T value for the 90% CI will be smaller than the T value for the 95% CI. Okay. So we had actually talked about this a little bit at the beginning of class. Basically, for the same sample size and the same standard deviation, increasing the confidence level will make the error the interval wider. Decreasing the confidence level will make the arrow, sorry, will make the interval narrower. So in this situation, we're having, we have the same sample size and the same standard deviation. We're going to decrease confidence level from 95 to 90. And as a result, the interval is going to become narrower or shrink um, following the margin of error formula. Okay, so we can show this is true just by computing the interval. Now, the assumptions for this are gonna be exactly the same as they were in the first example because it's the exact same set of data. Okay, so the assumptions do not change. So see above. Okay, and the only thing that's really going to be different here is our t value. So on step one, we're going to have alpha is one minus zero point nine. which is equal to 0 0.10. So therefore T alpha over two N minus one is gonna be a T value on 0 0.05 and five. All right. So if we go to our student T table, we now have T 0 0.055, that's 2.015. Okay. All right, so this is 2.015. And then on step two, we're going to have X bar plus or minus T 0 0.05 and 5 multiplied by S over the square root of n. This is gonna be 2.03 plus or minus 2.015 multiplied by 0 0.068 over the square root of six. And that's going to give us, uh, I guess I can compute this thing real quick. 
that's going to give us 2.03 plus or minus 0 0.0559. All right, and then as a result, we will have 1.974 to 2.086. And then here we will have, we are 90% confidence that the true mean TSC is between 1.974 and 2.086. Right. And then if we look at the intervals, we can see here we have 1.959 to 2.101. And here we have 1.974 to 2.086. So the lower bound on the 90% interval is larger than the lower bound on the 95% interval. And the upper bound on the 90% interval is smaller than the upper bound on the 95% interval, which essentially is telling us that the 90% interval is the bounds are closer together than they are for the 95% interval, indicating that it is narrower. If we wanted to, we could also compute the length of each interval and then compare those, but we would end up with the exact same result. Any questions? Okay, so in the um, first example, or in the preceding example, we looked at a normal probability plot. I discussed that with a normal, prob normal probability plot, what we are using the plot for is to, to determine if there's evidence that the population that we sampled from is normal. Basically, what the normal probability plot does is it takes your observed values in the sample and it computes a estimate or a stand or it standardizes those values so it might use a formula like the one shown here so it'll say the standardized value is the value from the sample which is xi minus the sample mean over s and then it'll compare those to the values from the standard normal table this slide is meant just to give you a little bit of insight into what the normal probability plot is actually doing in terms of construction, this is not something that we're gonna to need to do by hand. So we will be using SPSS in the labs to build normal probability plots. And on the assignments and whatnot, you'll usually just be given the plot um, and asked to interpret it. But again, just to give you a little bit of insight into how these plots are being constructed, they're basically just standardizations of the values in the sample versus the quantiles from the normal distribution. And you can actually compare the raw values in the sample to those same those same quantiles from the normal distribution directly. And this is how we teach the QQ plot or the normal probability plot in STAT 151. But again, the key takeaway here is that we want to form normality with the quantiles of the normal. So what we want to do is basically plot our data against these normal values and check to see if they're linear. If they are, that's evidence that the population that we sampled from is normal, and we require that assumption for both tests, but in particular, the t-tests and the t-confidence intervals. Right. Okay, so the confidence interval, again, is a statistical inferential technique that gives us a range of values that we believe the population mean could be between. 
We don't know if the individual interval that we constructed is going to contain the population mean. So that is why we use the word confident when we are interpreting our population mean. Um, we learned how to construct confidence intervals using either a Z score or a T value. So we use the T value when the population standard deviation is unknown, and we use the Z score when we have the population standard deviation. Otherwise, both procedures have basically the same assumption set. If sigma is known, the central limit theorem will be enough to check off the normality assumption. If sigma is unknown, we actually need to have evidence that the population that we sampled from is normal. Um, okay, so on the next slide, I have a cumulative exercise sort of embedded in the middle part um, of the lecture set. Typically, I leave the cumulative exercises as um, extra work for the students uh, for you to work on after class, and I will post the solutions to these. I think just for the sake of time, I will continue with this approach. So I will leave this as um, like sort of a homework style question that you can work on after class, and I'll post the solution to it with the completed lecture notes. This is essentially just like a review style question of the topics that we've talked about so far. All right, so we're gonna move on to talking about hypothesis tests now. So we have learned how to construct confidence intervals. That's our first inferential technique. Now we're gonna talk about um, hypothesis tests. This is our second inferential technique. And the hypothesis test is an approach that we are gonna see throughout the semester. So associated with all of the different types of um, methods that we are going to learn about is a hypothesis test. So we are going to see statistical hypothesis testing in a variety of different settings. What hypothesis testing is, is a approach for, ask, for answering a question. And the questions that we ask when we are conducting a hypothesis test are almost always about the values that we are observing, or more importantly, about the population quantity, more straight, more correct to say this. The hypothesis tests that we are using are always a question about the population value that we are interested in studying. So in the single sample case, which is the case that we are working on right now, the hypothesis test is an approach for us to ask a question about that single population mean. Right, so for example, we might say uh, question three here is related to the single sample case. So suppose um, it's claimed that the average amount of beer in a bottle in a, two, in, a, in a case of 24 is 330 milliliters. We might collect, um, you know, like 20 cases of beer and measure how much is in each bottle and then ask if it's true that the average amount of beer per case is equal to 330. And that would be a situation where a statistical hypothesis test can be utilized. So again, the purpose of the hypothesis test is to ask a direct question about the population mean. The hypothesis test and the confidence interval are actually very closely related. And for the same confidence level, they will agree. So we can get the same conclusion from both. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, later on when we start looking at examples. All right, so setting up the hypothesis test is actually very straightforward. It has six steps associated with it. The first step is the declaration of the null and the alternative hypothesis. There are three types of null and alternatives, and I will review these with you um, after I go through the six steps. On step two, we just declare the significance level. This can also be done with step one. I just write them as separate steps for clarity. Step three, we compute our test statistic. So you can see here that we're either gonna be using a Z score or a T value, depending on what information is given to us. So if we have the population standard deviation, we're gonna use a Z score. If we do not, we're gonna use a T value. So that's the same rationale that we had for the confidence interval. On step four, we're then either going to use a critical value process or a p-value process. When I work through the illustrations with you in class, 
I will go through both approaches. So I, so I will show you an example of the critical value approach, and I will show you an example of the p-value approach. You do not need to do both on assignments and tests. You only have to choose between one of them unless you are specifically told to take a particular approach. I am, again, just going to illustrate both so that you have examples. Step five, we make our conclusion, which is dependent on the previous step. And then in step six, we interpret the results. The hypothesis test has the exact same assumptions as the interval. So the two assumptions that we were checking for the confidence interval approach, we will use those again for the hypothesis tests. All right, on step one, we declare our null and alternative hypotheses. So the null hypothesis, or rather, there are three different types of hypothesis, um, null and alternative hypothesis. In all situations, the null hypothesis really represents equality, although for the upper and lower tail test, you can see that I am using opposing symbols. The alternative hypothesis essentially uh, communicates the question of interest. So we're going to ask one of three things. Is mu different from some value, which is this part here? Is mu greater than some value? Which is this part here. Or is mu less than some value, which is this part here. So we have three hypothesis tests. Each one has an alternative that represents a particular style of question. And the alternative is always going to reflect the question of interest. And then the null hypothesis will essentially just give the opposing symbol. But in all cases, the null hypothesis really just represents equality. And that's how we treat it within the study. Right. OK, when we conduct a hypothesis test, there are two major types of errors that can, um, can occur. These are called type 1 error and type 2 error. A type 1 error occurs when we reject the null hypothesis, but the null hypothesis was actually true. And a type two error occurs when we fail to reject the null hypothesis, but the null hypothesis was actually false. Right. Okay. So the type one error and the type two error are actually not complements. So we can say that the probability of committing a type one error is equal to alpha. So this is the probability that you reject H0 given H0 is true. And this is the probability that you do not reject h0 given h0 is false. Okay, so we designate the probability of a type 1 error as alpha, and we designate the probability of a type 2 error as beta. Now, you can see here that alpha and beta are not complementary. So alpha plus beta does not equal 1. In fact, the relationship between alpha and beta is better described uh, via a seesaw analogy. Okay. So the relationship between alpha and beta is typically described using a C saw analogy, right? So what I mean here is, if you were to imagine C saw, it looks like this, right? So let's suppose that we have beta at this end and we have alpha at this end. As alpha goes up, beta goes down, that's true. But the actual relationship between the two 
is more of a parabolic relationship. Right? So they, as one increases, the other one does decrease. It just doesn't do so in a linear fashion. All right? But if you were to, for example, minimize the significance level, that would push beta as high as it could go. It's just, again, not going to be linear. Any questions? Okay, so on step five, we have to make a decision about whether to reject the, the null hypothesis or to not reject the null hypothesis. And the decision can be made based off either the critical value approach or the p-value approach. With the critical value approach, which is the approach that's typically preferred by students, it's basically just a comparison of the test statistic to the critical value. So the critical value is essentially a boundary between um, what you could think of as the non-rejection region and the rejection region. So the critical, if the test statistic passes the critical value and enters the rejection region, that would give us evidence to reject. Now, the tricky part is the rejection region's location will change depending on the kind of test. And I'll show you some examples of these uh, momentarily. And then there's further illustrations of these and the um, cumulative exercises at the end of the lecture set. Okay. With the p-value approach, the comparison is actually a lot easier because the p-value for every type of test, um, or rather for every type of test, we will reject the null hypothesis if the p-value is less than alpha. Okay. So the p-value is essentially the, is defined as the probability of observing a test statistic more extreme than the one observed under the assumption that the null is true. Okay, so the p-value basically measures the strength of the evidence against the null. So the smaller the p-value, the more likely it is that the null have, or the, the smaller the p-value, the more evidence that we should reject the null hypothesis. However, the issue here is what is small enough that we can say we need to reject? So what we do is we introduce the significance level and we use the significance level as a cutoff to determine how small the p-value needs to be to warrant rejection. All right. So the significance level basically represents the boundary again between what is deemed small enough to uh, or what p-value would be small enough to say that there's enough evidence against the null to warrant rejection right any questions about that All right, so let's look at an example where we can put these things together. All right, a researcher collects a simple random sample of 16 pieces of tuna and finds that the average mercury content of the sample is 0 0.74 parts per million. Given that the mercury content of tuna is known to be normally distributed with sigma equals 0 0.08, is there evidence that the true mean mercury content is greater than 0 0.4 parts per million at alpha equals 0 0.05? All right, so we start off by checking the assumptions of the test. So the first assumption is that we collected a simple random sample, and this is good. We're told that we have a simple random sample. The second assumption is normality or more specifically, 
that we have a normally distributed population or that there's enough uh, or that we've collected a large enough sample size that the central limit theorem would take over. And this again is sufficient because we are told here that we have a normally distributed population. Okay, we want to know is there evidence that the true mean mercury content is greater than 0.04? So we want evidence mean mercury content greater than 0.04 parts per million. So on step one, we are going to construct an upper tail test. So our mu is going to be less than or equal to 0.4 versus the alternative. And again, here in the alternative, we are specifying the question of interest. So we want to test if mean mercury content is greater than 0 0.4. So we have mu greater than 0 0.4 here. Okay. So we're reflecting the question of interest in the alternative hypothesis. On step two, we state the significance level which is 0 0.05. On step three, we're gonna compute our test statistic. Okay, so in this question, we are told that sigma is 0 0.08, which means that our test statistic is going to be a Z-score. So our sample mean here is 0 0.74. We're told in the question that the average of the 16 pieces of tuna is 0 0.74. So that's why this is X bar. Mu naught is 0 0.40 because that's what we're testing against. Sigma is 0 0.08 and our sample size is 16. Okay, so this is gonna give us a test statistic of 17. So it's very extreme in this case. Okay. okay, so on step four, we can take either the p-value approach or the critical value approach. Again, I'm gonna show you both. So starting with the critical value approach, the first thing we do is sketch our standard normal curve. Okay. So here's my standard normal curve centered at zero. We are performing an upper tail test, right? So we have mu greater than 0 0.4. Therefore, the rejection region is going to be in the upper tail of the curve. All right, so this is going to be the rejection region. And then everything over on this side will be non rejection region. All right. The critical value for the test is the Z score that bounds the rejection region. So this is going to be a Z score on alpha, which is a Z score on 0 0.05. So this means that the rejection region is a size of 0 0.05. And then the non-rejection region is going to be a size 0 0.95. Okay. So what we're looking for here is the Z score that puts 0 0.05 of the area in the upper tail and the remaining 0 0.95 in the lower tail. In this case, what we can do is actually go to our T table 
we can go to the little chart at the bottom of the T table. And here you can see it says Z subscript 0 0.05 is 1.645, right? So the critical value that is bounding the rejection and the non-rejection region is equal to 1.645. Okay, our test statistic is equal to 17. So clearly, the test statistic is well into that rejection region. So we might mark it for illustrative purposes. We might mark the test statistic right here. So this is Z equals 17. And the point is that we can see that that test statistic is well into the rejection region. So that's going to warrant rejection of the null hypothesis. Any questions? <sighs> Eight AM. Eight AM. We can do it. All right, so assuming there's no questions, we'll look at the p-value approach now, and then I'll show you how to make the decision after that. But I mean, essentially, if you recall the previous work and you can understand what I'm illustrating here, you can see the test statistic is into that rejection region, so that's why we are rejecting. All right, p-value. Okay, so the p-value approach starts with the same um, illustration. So I'm gonna start simply by sketching out a standard normal curve. All right, now the difference here is the way the p-value approach works is you simply take your test statistic and you mark it on the, vert on the horizontal axis of the curve. So let's say just so that we can see it clearly, here is my test statistic. Now the p-value is going to be the area to the left or the right of the test statistic based off of um, the alternative hypothesis. So what I mean is we have an upper tail test. So because the test is upper tailed, our p-value is going to be the area to the right of the test statistic. So this green shaded part here. Okay, so this is the p-value. Okay, so the p-value is an area underneath the standard normal curve. So we can actually write a probability expression for the p-value based off of the illustration that we have just, um, just given. So we have step four continued. The p-value is equal to the probability that a z-score is greater than 17. Okay, so we want to find the probability a z-score exceeds 17. So we're gonna to go to our standard normal table. All right, and what we're looking for is 17. Now you can see here at the bottom of the standard normal table, it says for z any z greater than or equal to 3.9, the areas are 1.00 to four decimal places. So what the standard normal table is telling us is that anytime we have a z score that's bigger than 3.9, we can assume that the area to the left is effectively equal to one. 
So that would mean here that this value is going to be one minus the probability that Z is less than 17, which is basically one minus 1 1.0000, which is approximately equal to zero. So basically the p-value for this particular test based off of the standard normal table is approximately equal to zero. All right, so on step five, we can conclude. So if we were to use the critical value approach, we're gonna say since um, Z equals 17, exceeds, or sorry, let's use better language, is greater than Z 0 0.05 equals 1.645. We can reject H naught. So basically, since the test statistic is in the rejection region, we can reject H naught. If we were to take the p-value approach, we would say since the p-value is less than alpha, we can reject H naught. And again, with the p-value approach, the nice thing is that it's always the same rule. So regardless of what type of test you're conducting, if the p-value is less than alpha, you can reject. And that is regardless of whether or not it's upper tail, lower tail, or two-tailed. Okay, so now we get to conclude the test. In concluding a hypothesis test, we, we effectively have the same style of uh, kind of built-in statement that we have for a confidence interval. So here we would say at the 5% significance level, the data provide sufficient evidence to suggest that at the 5% significance level, the data provides sufficient evidence to suggest that the population mean average mercury content exceeds, or sorry, let me just say is greater than, is greater than 0 .0, 0, 0 0.0, 0 0.40 parts per million. All right. Any questions? Okay, so now we'll look at an example of a hypothesis test where the um, population standard deviation is unknown. So in this illustration, are they both? Okay. We have 
A manufacturer produces quarter inch machine screws that are supposed to have a weight of 2.888 grams. Suppose 50 bolts yield X bar 2.903 grams and a sample standard deviation of 0.087 grams. Without checking the assumptions, does the sample provide evidence that the population mean weight is different from 2.888 grams at alpha 0.01? discuss the validity of the hypothesis test. All right, so starting off, we wanna know, is there evidence mean weight different from, okay? So what we are interested in running here is a two-sided hypothesis test. So we have H0 mu is equal to uh, 2.888 versus H0 mu is different from 2.888. On step two, we have Alpha is equal to 0 0.01. On step three, we're going to compute a T value because we do not have sigma. So we are told that little s is equal to 0 0.087. So since we are working with a sample standard deviation, we're going to be working with a T value. Same rationale that we utilize for the confidence interval. So we have T is equal to X bar minus mu zero over little s divided by the square root of N. So this is gonna be 2.903 minus 2.888 divided by 0 0.087 over the square root of 50. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. So we have 2.903 minus 2.888 divided by 0 0.087 divided by the square root 50. All right, and that gives us 1.219. All right, so just like before, we can take a critical value approach or a p-value approach. The only difference here is that we're gonna be using the student T curve rather than the standard normal curve. We also are gonna be running a two-tailed test, which means that the rejection region is gonna get split into the two tails of the T curve. So I'll start by sketching out our T curve. And this sketch is going to be essentially is going to be the same as what I sketched for the standard normal curve. We just need a symmetric bell curve uh, that we can use to visualize the areas. Right. Okay, now because it's a two tailed test, the rejection region is going to get split into each of the tails. Right. So we're gonna have a rejection region here, and we're gonna have a rejection region here. Now, the T value is going to reflect the fact that we've split the area into each tail. So we're going to have T subscript alpha over two and minus one. So whenever we run a two-tailed test, we divide the significance level by two. 
If we run a one tail test, we put all of the significance level into one tail. So this is going to be T 0 0.005 comma 49, right? Now, because the curve is symmetric, on the other side of the curve, you're going to have the same uh, magnitude for the T value, except it's going to, but it'll be a negative quantity. So we could just mark this value down here as negative T 0 0.005 comma 49. Okay, so now we go to our student T table. We're matching um, 0 0.005 to 49. Okay, so 0 0.005 is in the last column. 49 is in the last row. That gives us 2.680. Okay, so here we have positive 2.680, and here we have negative 2.680. Our test statistic was 1.219, so that's going to be somewhere around here. So we can see that the test statistic is not getting into the rejection region in either tail, so in this case we will not reject the null. Right. Any questions? All right. All right, now if we were to take the p-value approach, we would start off by sketching the curve. All right, so this is gonna be centered at zero. Then what we would do is mark down our test statistic and because it's a two-tailed test, we're also going to consider the other tail as well. So we would just take that same value and make it a negative. All right. Okay, so our p-value is now going to be the area in each of the tails. So we can write here, the p value is equal to the probability that t exceeds 1.219 plus the probability that t is less than negative 1.219. This is going to be two times the probability that t exceeds 1.219 because the sizes of each area are the same. So these are identical sizes in each tail. So we can just multiply one of the uh, expressions by two. Now what we need to do is find an expression for the probability that T exceeds 1.219. Okay, so to do this, we go back to our T table. We select the degree of freedom. And then what we do is we scroll across the line and we look for where our T value is gonna fall in. Now in this situation, you can see that our T value, 1.219, is smaller than the very first value listed on the line. So our T value is gonna to sit to the left of 1.299. That means that the area above 1.2 one nine must be greater than 0 
So what we can say here is since the probability that t exceeds 1.219 is greater than 0 0.1. Then the p value must be greater than two times 0 0.1 because it's a two tailed test and we are multiplying this expression by two. So the p value is greater than 0 0.2. Any questions? Uh, no, they usually prefer the critical value method, um, mainly because of what I just illustrated. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would say that you do. You certainly need to be able to use a p-value. So, for example, in lab, when you're using SPSS, for every single type of test, you're going to be given the p-value directly. So you need to be able to use it to make a decision. Um, I assume that the process that I just went through is probably confusing for some of you, hence the last two questions. It is recommended that you are able to work your way through this, we're going to see this style of finding p-values in a lot of different situations as we progress through the semester. So there will be more practice that comes with it, but this is also something that was, um, you, you can also practice this using the cumulative exercises at the end of class. So if you need to review this method, there is more practice that you can do to kind of go over this approach. I mean, the truth is like you could probably get away with not really knowing how to do this, but the recommendation would be that you're able to do both. But for the most part, you will be able to choose, which was um, for the most part, you'll be able to choose between them. But if there's a situation where you're directly told to use the p-value approach, then obviously you'll have to know how to do it in that situation. Does that, does that answer your questions? Okay, so if we take the critical value approach, you can see that the test statistic did not get into the rejection region. So here we would say, do not reject H0 since T equals 1.219 does not get into the rejection region. And then if we were to take the p-value approach, so our significance level is 0 0.01. Since alpha equals 0 0.01, any value larger then 0 0.2 is greater than 0 0.01. So the p value is greater than alpha. So we do not reject H0, right? So basically, our p-value is bigger than 0 0.2. 
Anything bigger than 0 0.2 must be bigger than 0 0.01. Therefore, we will not reject the null. Okay, so then we can say at the 1% significance level, the data provide sufficient evidence to suggest that, oh, sorry, the data do not provide. The data do not provide sufficient evidence to suggest that the population mean bolt weight is different from uh, 2.888. Okay, so our, our conclusion in this case is basically that there's no evidence to suggest that the alternative might be true, and that's how we phrase the conclusions of our hypothesis test. So the conclusions that we write on step six are always in terms of the alternative. All right, now there was one other portion of this test here. So we wanted to uh, comment on the validity of the test, I believe is what the statement says, discuss the validity of the hypothesis test. Okay, so essentially what we're saying here is without being able to verify that the assumptions hold, we cannot uh, trust the conclusion of this test, essentially. Okay, so in order to use the conclusion of this test, we would need to verify the assumptions of um, the utilized test. Okay. And uh, in this case, we would need to know. So for the SRS assumption, we would need to know where or how data was sampled. And for normality, we could just do something like construct a normal probability plot. Build a normal plot. All right, um, just finished in the nick of time. Okay, so as a reminder, assignment number one uh, is due tomorrow. Assignment two will be released tomorrow, and that's due two weeks after. Assignment two will basically be lecture set two and lecture set three. So it'll be hypothesis testing and confidence interval construction. On Tuesday, we will do the last illustration from this lecture set, and then we will start lecture set three, which is a, which is a, um, a review of two sample inference. Okay, so um, I will 
sorry, yeah, Annalise, and uh, the assignments are always due at 11.59 p.m. via Crowdmark, so a minute before midnight. Uh, so I will talk to you guys on Tuesday. I have office hours tomorrow at 10, and if anyone has any questions for me, I'll hang around after class. Otherwise, have a good weekend, and I will speak to you next Tuesday.